Lord Jesus, you fasted 40 days and 40 nights for our sake. Give us discipline in mind and thought and body to follow your ideals through Jesus Christ. Amen. Page 97, Millard Erickson's Christian Theology. Redaction, criticisms, orientation, and emphasis are somewhat different from those of form criticism. Form criticism concentrates more on the independent <coughs> individual units of material, having to break them off from the framework. It attempts to understand them in a more fundamental form. Redaction criticism, on the other hand, is more concerned with the framework itself, with later forms of the tradition in the final stage of the evangelist's own frame of reference. A number of redaction critics begin begin like the more radical form critics, assuming that the evangelists were not greatly concerned about what Jesus said it did. On this basis, the gospel writers are regarded as saying things that serve their purposes. Norm Perrin here is quoted, what is redaction criticism? I've got that over here somewhere. Very much of the materials in the Gospels must be ascribed to the theological motivation of the evangelist, dogmatically asserted. And what's baked in there is you know, he's interested in telling you the theology without concern for history. It's baked in. We must take as our starting point the assumption that the Gospels offer us directly information about the theology of the early church and not about teaching. Here, there we go. Not about the teaching of the historical Jesus. There you have it, right there. That any information we may derive from them about Jesus can come only as a result of stringent application of very carefully contrived material for authenticity. With such an approach, there is, of course, no assumption of what is reportedly a word from Jesus is an authentic, rather the burden of proof lies upon the person who assumes the words to be authentic, shifting the burden of proof. But that can just be flipped right back on uh, Normie. Consider the comment of Ernst Kossmann. The obligation now laid upon us is to investigate and make credible not the possible unauthenticity of the individual unit of material but on the contrary, it's genuineness. So it's assumed ungenuine until proven otherwise. That's the dogmatic principle. Perrin makes a similar comment. The nature of the synoptic tradition is such that the burden of proof will be cast upon the claim to authenticity. There's, that's just wild. In the hands of the more radical redaction criticism critics, Skepticism has arisen, not unlike that of the more extreme form critics. For now, many of the sayings attributed to Jesus must be understood actually as the words not of Jesus, but of the evangelists. If form criticism says that the Gospels give us more of the faith of the church than the words of Jesus, then redaction criticism says the Gospels give us a large extent of the theology of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Faith becomes faith, not in the Jesus who was, but in the Jesus who was believed. And you can see what's baked in there. Poison right in with the sugar and the cake. Rather lengthy lists of criteria have been drawn up in efforts to determine what are traditional and what are redactional materials. William Walker has compiled a list of steps to follow in attempting to distinguish redactional from traditional material in his Catholic article, A Method of Identifying Redactional Passages in Matthew on Functional and Linguistic Grounds, Catholic Journal. He proceeds on the assumption, a rather conservative one, that material is to be considered traditional unless there is good reason to consider it redactional. His criteria include both functional and linguistic factors. 
among passages which on the basis of their function may be considered redactional are those which explain, interpret, or otherwise comment on the accompanying material, provide condensed summaries of some general features, Jesus preaching, teaching, healing frame, foreshadow or anticipate events to be related later in the gospel, four, introduce collections or sayings, five, provide brief indications of time, place, or circumstance. Significant linguistic phenomena occurring often in one gospel, but seldom or never in others, may be a sign of redactional origin. Criticisms of redaction criticism. R.S. Barbour, uh, Reform the World, 1975, has pointed up, well, the shortcomings of the redactios. Redactio seemed to credit the evangelists with a remarkable refinement of theological purpose and method. The authors apparently utilized a great deal of subtlety and indirectness in the arrangement and modification of their material, creating their own new emphases for old stories and sayings. It is almost as if they had mastered the modern methods of verisimilitude. In this respect, they are virtually without peril in the ancient or even modern world, but it seems unlikely that they had this amount of ingenuity and creativity. The search for the sits in Labim has a tendency to assume that everything in the Gospels or New Testament is said with a particular audience and particular issue in view. While this is true of much of the Old Testament, it's highly questionable that all should be so regarded. The force of linguistic or stylistic criteria, vary, criteria varies greatly. It may be of significance that the little word tota then occurs 91 times in Matthew, six times in Mark 14 and Luke 10 in John. But to conclude that a certain phrase is redactional because it occurs four times in Luke and Acts, but not the other gospels is unwarranted. It is sometimes assumed that the theology of the author can be determined from the editorial passages alone. But the traditional material is in many respects just as significant for this purpose, since the editor did choose to include it after all. Redaction criticism as a method limits itself to the investigation of the situation and purpose of the evangelists does not raise the historicity of the material recorded in the works. There's a tendency in redaction criticism to follow the Geschichte history distinction found in form criticism. It is supposed that the gospel writers were unconcerned with the significance of history or its impact on lives in the church Geschichte, not with the facts of history, not with what actually happened. It was the present experience with the risen Lord which motivated the evangelists. Both their view of the past and their hope for the future were shaped by the experience with this person in the present. According to Perrin, the Gospels are, in a sense, very similar to the letters to the seven churches in Revelation. Although the Gospels take the form of stories and sayings from the past, and Revelation is focused on the future, both cases it is Jesus's message to the present and that is what matters see what's baked in there history doesn't matter since the gospel writers then were relatively unconcerned about what happened in the past so is redaction criticism values of redaction and criticism and then we'll talk about we're gonna get Criticism, of redaction criticism. Oh, that was it. We've seen that there are problems with redaction criticism. Is it taken as a means of distinguishing traditional and redactional material? This is particularly so. If we assume that no given unit shall be considered authentic unless it's demonstrated so to be, there are not values in careful use of redaction criticism. Here we should note that there are at least two meanings of redaction criticism, a wider 
and a narrower sense. In the narrow sense, it refers to a school of German scholarship whose members, not all of whom are of German now nationality, regard themselves as successors of the form critics. In the broader sense, it includes all the works in which the evangelists are not treated as mere compilers, but as authors with a point of view or even a theology of their own. <clears throat> in this latter sense, there have been redaction critics throughout much of the history of the church, even before the rise of modern methods of criticism. They've attempted to see simply the distinctive ways in which each author adapted and applied the material. The work of these critics can be a benefit to the evangelical Bible scholar. A number of evangelical Bible scholars have argued for a restrictive use of redaction criticism. They note that the late Ned Stonehouse of Westminster was using its sounder methods before the school ever developed. They advocate utilizing its techniques, but on the foundation of presuppositions harmonious with the stated claims of the Bible itself. Redaction criticism is seen as a means of elucidating the biblical message. Grant Osborne lists three values. It can rebut the destructive use of critical tools and substantiate the veracity of the text. The delineating of redactional emphases aids the scholar in determining the particular emphasis of the evangelist. Use of the redactional tools helps answer synoptic problems. To these I would add a fourth. By observing how a given evangelist adapted and applied the material he'd received, we can gain insight into how the message of Christ can be adapted to new situations which we encounter. These biblical authors were doing essentially what a preacher or teacher does today in communicating his message to his audience. The activity of the evangelist then included interpretation. They were taking Jesus' statements and paraphrasing them, expanding them, condensing them. They were, however, remaining true to the original teaching of Jesus. Just as a preacher or a writer today may make the use of a point somewhat differently or vary the application in accordance with the audience, so the evangelists were adapting but not distorting the tradition. And the idea that they actually created savings of Jesus, sayings of Jesus, putting their own words and ideas into his mouth is to be rejected. T.F. France, the authenticity of the sayings of Jesus in Rhodes Rediscovering. Our conclusion from all this is that while it is undeniable that the evangelists and their predecessors adapted, selected, and reshaped the material which came down to them, there is no reason to extend this freedom to include the creation of new sayings attributed to Jesus that in fact such evidence as we have points decisively the other way to a respect for the sayings of Jesus, such as was sufficient to prevent any of his followers from attributing their own teaching to him. What we have them is not ipsissima verba, but ipsissima vox. We do not have exactly the words which Jesus spoke we do have the substance of what he said. We have what Jesus would have said if he were addressing the exact same group which the evangelists were addressing. And he slipped here on his uh, doctrine of inspiration and inerrancy. Thus, the gospel writers cannot be accused of misrepresenting or misconstruing Jesus, what Jesus said. Inerrancy does not demand that the logid Yesu, the sayings of Jesus, and saying the ipsima verba, the exact words of Jesus, only the ipsissima vox. When a New Testament writer cites the sayings of Jesus, it may not be that Jesus said those same exact words. Undoubtedly, 
the word, exact words of Jesus are to be found in the New Testament, but they need not be so in every instance. For one thing, many of the sayings were spoken by our Lord in Aramaic, and therefore had to be translated into Greek. Moreover, the writers of the New Testament did not have available to them the linguistic conventions we have today. Thus, it is impossible for us to know which sayings are direct quotes, which are indirect discourse, and which are even freer renderings. With regard to the sayings of what Jesus, what in the light of these facts would count against inerrancy. If the sense of the words attributed to Jesus by the writers were not uttered by Jesus, or if the exact words of Jesus are so construed that they have a sense Jesus never intended, then inerrancy would be threatened. One way in which the more conservative understanding of redaction criticism differs from the more skeptical variety is their explanations of the precise nature of the evangelist's redaction work. Several positions are possible, for example, with respect to the origin of the sayings of Jesus, which are found in one of the Gospels, but not in the tradition. One position is one position is that if the writer was fully dependent upon the received tradition for what he wrote, the saying must present a creation on his part in a position as it were, of his own views on Jesus. A second position is that a saying found in the Bible, but not in the tradition, may have been an attempt to give expression to the believer's present experience with the risen Lord. That it may have been an attempt to relate the early church's understanding of the present situation. A third possibility is that although this saying in question was not uttered by Jesus during his earthly ministry, it was nevertheless specially revealed by the risen and ascended evangelist. Blah, blah, blah. Guidelines. Here we go for evaluating critical methods. Number one, we need to be on guard against assumptions which are anti-supernatural in import. For example, if the miraculous is considered unhistorical because it is not uniform with our experience today, we ought to be aware that something of Boltman's closed continuum, according to all events, are bound in a causal network, is present. We need to be watchful for the presence of circular reasoning. Critics who use stories of the Gospels to help them could reconstruct the sits and laban of the early church and then use this sits and laban to explain the origin of the same stories are guilty of circular reasoning. Three, we should be watchful for unwarranted inferences. <coughs> Similarity of thought sometimes is understood to indicate a common origin or causal connection, identifying the circumstances in which an idea, <clears throat> an idea is taught is sometimes thought to exclude the possibility of it having been taught in other circumstances. It is supposed that a saying which expresses a belief of the church was never spoken by Jesus. There is a suppressed premise here, namely, something is found in the teaching of the church, what Perrin calls dissimilarity, and Reggie Fuller calls distinctiveness, is regarded as a criterion of authenticity. But this assumption, when laid bare in this fashion, begins to look rather arbitrary and even improbable. We need to beware of arbitrariness and subjectivity. For example, redaction critics often attach a considerable degree of conclusiveness to the reconstructions of the Sitz and Laban, to their explanation of causes and origins. Number five, we should be alert to the presence of assumptions regarding an antithetical relationship between faith and reason. For example, Perrin speaks of the view 
that the early Christian preaching was interested in historical reminiscence, and the opposite view that it was theologically motivated. This seems to suggest there's a conflict between theological motivation, faith, and historical interest and concern. This apparent conflict is reflected in the rather sharp distinction between history and Geschichte. And this in turn goes back to Soren Kierkegaard, his distinction between. All right. Between objective and subjective thinking, he asserted the amount of inward passion or subjectivity is inversely proportional to the amount of objective evidence or certainty. This view of faith and reason may be correct, although I do not think so. You should be aware, however, that it is only an assumption. Six, we need to note that in all these matters, we are dealing with probability rather than certainty, and that where probabilities build upon one another. <laughs> Philip Edge could be used here. There's a cumulative effect upon the conclusion. For example, if we work with a premise which has a probability of 75%, then the probability of the conclusion is 75%. If, however, we work with two pr premises, the probability of the final conclusion is only 56%, 3, 42%, 4, 32%. In much of redaction criticism, there's a whole series of such premises, each depending on the preceding one, and with correspondingly declining probability. This should be kept in mind when evaluating the conclusions of redaction criticism. It should be apparent that biblical criticism need not be negative in its results when the method is formulated using assumptions that are open to the possibility of the supernatural and the authenticity of the materials, and criteria are applied that are not more severe than those used in other areas of inquiry, very positive results occur. Thus, Jehoiakim Jeremias says that the language and style of the synoptic gospels show so much usefulness and respect toward the tradition of the sayings of Jesus that we are justified in drawing up the following principle in this method. In the synoptic tradition, it is the inauthenticity and not authenticity of the sayings of Jesus that must be demonstrated. He flips the onus of proof. This is, of course, rests on the assumption of the reliability of the sources. But this assumption, when tested against the data, proves more reasonable than the alternative. Biblical criticism then, if used, carefully used and based upon assumptions that are consistent with the full authority of the scripture, can be helpful means of shedding further light on the meaning of the scripture. And although the Bible need not satisfy biblical criticism's criteria of authenticity to be accepted or dependable, when it does satisfy those standards, we have additional confirmation of its reliability. Let us close here. Glory be to the Father, and the Son, and Holy Ghost.